through this. Uh, hi, everybody. Dan Walsh here. And I'm going to talk about uh, uh, resilient metabolism of recyclable um, urban aggregate material. I'm going to look back, look present day, and look forward. Now, of course, our goal is uh, circular economy. We want to avoid this uh, this linear economy that we're so familiar with, where urban areas take in uh, raw materials, resource materials, consume them, and, and export them to disposal sites in other ecosystems outside the city. But the fact is, when it comes to solid waste, uh, cities for centuries uh, in, in the U.S. and around the world have been um, using circular economy, uh, but just not in an environmentally protective way. And let's talk a, a, just a minute about that. Um, this graph shows a, a summary of uh, solid waste disposal in New York City from 1900 to the present day. Uh, and this is annual data that I've been collecting for many years, um, all in one place. And what it shows is um, uh, how New York City has managed its waste. And it's only in the last uh, 20 years or so, since about 2001, that New York City has had a linear economy when it came to its solid waste. Before that, uh, all of New York City's waste materials were, were managed, disposed somewhere within the city. And um, uh, that was certainly a circular economy, but uh, with severe environmental implications. Um, this is a photograph before uh, 1900 showing uh, an ancient landfill. Uh, and in this era, uh, the uh, you know, wetland areas, tidal and freshwater wetlands were, were considered a severe health threat. So the, the goal, the public health goal at the time was to eradicate wetlands uh, to eliminate disease vectors. And the, the method was use of solid waste, waste materials uh, to cover these sites over and eradicate them. And that was done with amazing uh, um, uh, skill, uh, if you could call it that, for, for many years, really uh, the peak years from about the 1920s through the 1950s. This is a, a heartbreaking photograph, a series of aerials. On the left is a 400 square um, acre uh, tidal wetland. And on the right, a photo taken about 10 years later showing a landfill literally moving from the top down and obliterating that wetland area. Literally um, tens of thousands of wetlands in New York City were eradicated in just that way. And the city's policy for years, and this is public health based policy, was to eradicate wetlands, reclaim land for a wide variety of uses. Um, uh, and I'll just cover a few very quickly. Um, the waste materials were used to um, straighten and truncate water bodies, uh, to deepen bulkhead lines, to promote uh, industrial activity and also warehousing. Uh, landfills were also used to promote the development of infrastructure, highways and bridges, airports, and many, many parklands. Uh, we've seen this earlier today. This is uh, um, from a publication uh, in, in the 1990s. Uh, this, is an, this shows um, land that was created mostly using solid waste. This is not the area of landfill in New York City. This is like the low end, uh, and it shows about 20%. I would estimate the actual area of landfill, meaning waste placed on land uh, in New York City to be closer to 40, maybe, uh, maybe 45%. And if we get back to this slide, uh, what you see on the right um, is where we are today. Uh, right now, we are exporting all of our solid waste, the solid waste we're not recycling, we're recycling maybe 15 or 18%, uh, relatively small fraction, and the rest is being disposed uh, elsewhere and not, not in New York City anymore. Uh, mostly out of state, um, in states like Pennsylvania, Virginia, New Jersey, and elsewhere in New York. Now that's the, the bulk solid waste stream, uh, and that, 
activity is driven by new environmental laws and regulations, and appropriately so. We really do need to solve the problems of the past uh, or, or not continue the problems of the past. But one of the problems, though, is the recyclable clean aggregates uh, are also being um, kind of thrust out of New York City. Shown here is just one example. This is clean soil generated during construction activity each year. New York City generates about 3 million tons of this enormous quantity and about 95% leaves New York City. Uh, this graph on the left shows you know, where uh, clean soil goes and it's all throughout the metropolitan area. Uh, we need this material for a wide variety of uses. Uh, we need it for resilience, we need it for environmental protection, uh, aggregates of all sorts, uh, you know, that are recyclable, reusable, have um, 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 a, a wide variety of, of valuable uses, and we need to start to figure out how to how to achieve those uses in a sustainable way. Uh, one one method that we know work rural exchanges, the New York City Clean Soil Bank which began operation in 2013. And if you look on the left, that shows the transfer of clean soil, which on the previous slide you saw shooting all over the region. Um, in this case, clean soil generated in New York City is transferred directly to other sites that need it in real time. Uh, and that's, a, that's how exchanges work. Um, and uh, exchanges can be utilized for a wide variety of material, uh, and it really is something that uh, needs to expand. Um, the examples could be recycled concrete, uh, wood chip, uh, emulsion wood chips, which uh, Jason talked about earlier at Cunningham Park. We developed a pilot program uh, right before I left city service. I'm not sure how that's going, but there are so many great opportunities for um, using these materials for productive uses in the city and not letting them uh, leave the city. Uh, and the key is not just reusing, but upcycling, using it for the highest and best use based on our current needs. Some examples, uh, and again, these are examples of, of real exchange uh, of materials um, in New York City. So the, these are not just uh, aspirational, these are real. Um, creation of wetlands, both fresh water and tidal wetlands, uh, the creation of structures that can impede uh, floodwaters um, during periods of storm. This is an example in Brooklyn Bridge Park, uh, dunes uh, and, and levees and berms are also uh, examples that can be utilized using these, these raw uh, recyclable materials. Can also use them to build interim flood protections. There are a couple examples in Brooklyn and the Bronx. These are HESCO bags that are protecting uh, vital infrastructure that is in low-lying areas, flood-prone areas. We also need about probably 80 million tons of soil to uh, cover highly polluted surface soils um, with a minimum of a foot uh, to two feet of clean material to provide that protective layer. Um, and we've seen uh, highly polluted community gardens that uh, need uh, attention uh, and aggregates that we generate here in New York City can be used for that purpose. And we need to do way more than we are uh, today. Um, other examples of use of aggregates, this is uh, on the right is in a, uh, kind of a sketch um, of, of a playground that has uh, a, sub, um, a depressed design as a, a means of storing stormwater and during uh, flash flood events. Um, it could be very easily included in this design, use of aggregate materials uh, below these structures to not only just store it, but also receive floodwaters uh, for re go into them, but it's not just what you do with the material. There are environmental benefits from keeping the material in the city and not 
um, shifting them out into other ecosystems outside the city. Now I'm just going to wrap this up. Um, made the the thirty years have been very effective at the goals they sought out uh, to achieve, but they absolutely don't promote circular economy. Uh, and if uh, we we stop where we are and, and, and claim success, we're not going to achieve this. We have a lot to do, and it's not going to come from the existing laws and regulations that are in place. Uh, to get this done, it's not a solution that's going to come to us from the federal government or state governments. They're just not leading on this, and frankly, they're not positioned uh, to, to implement uh, these types of solutions. The solutions have to be uh, implemented at the local level and cities need to lead uh, on this critical environmental issue. Uh, and then finally, just a note, I mean, based on where, we, where, we, where we've been, you know, every generation thinks it's got it right. And back in 1920, the, the idea of uh, eradicating wetlands was in their view, the right thing to do on public health grounds, uh, clearly uh, it wasn't. So we need to make sure that uh, we look at this in a holistic way and we get it right uh, today and into the future. And the way that's done is with a very um, clear uh, sound uh, founding in science. Uh, my, as a historian, I can tell you, uh, history is also an essential component of a, of a holistic approach. Um, involvement of communities and also government. But I would say, uh, let's not just rely and wait for the federal and state governments to work. Let's, let's do this with uh, uh, the leadership of local government. And that's, that's all I've got to say. I've uh, 